Uh, thank you and good morning. I have nothing to uh, disclose in relation to this presentation. The superficial femoral artery is the most commonly diseased artery, I think, in the human body. And because of the size and length of this vessel, it represents a large plaque burden, uh, which has been the Achilles heel for us as interventionists. The treatment is challenging because of some complexities of the um, SFA. And long-term patency, even though you've seen some data about drug-coated balloons and, and some other devices that you'll see this morning, long-term patency has been one of the uh, things that we've fallen short in treating these patients. So it's really unanswered to date what's the best treatment. The, uh, we need better patency for these complex lesions. If you look at the trials and you compare the data from most of these devices, you'll see that patients like the one represented in this panel are usually excluded from these trials. These are the patients that have very long areas of stenosis and high uh, calcium uh, concentration or high plaque burdens. And there may be a need for different platforms in different vascular territories. And by that, what I mean is that maybe we need a different platform for the SFA and for the infrapopliteal vessels and for the common femoral artery. And so that one size fitting all is probably not going to be the way this plays out in the future. Bare metal stents in the SFA have proven to be better than just balloon angioplasty. If you look at the literature for the short lesions, then angioplasty alone may be just as good as using a bare metal stent. When you get to the longer and more complex lesions, then stenting, because it scaffolds the artery open and, and uh, maintains patency, is probably better than PTA alone in these patients. And if you look through the literature, the range of patency varies anywhere from about 50% up to 80% or more. And the reason for that is because it's a very mixed population of patients that were being treated. Now, stent drug delivery in the SFA, uh, some of you may remember an old study, the uh, Sirocco study. And this was the first study using a drug-coated stent in the SFA. The early results at six months showed that there was no restenosis, so we were very excited. We had finally broken through and we had finally figured out how to treat these complex SFA lesions. Well, that turned out not to be a durable result. And in fact, it didn't achieve a significant reduction in And so Cordes, who was sponsoring this trial, actually abandoned this whole concept or this whole technology. And this was probably premature. There were some reasons why this didn't work. We had an idea. We were sort of on the right track, but we didn't follow through with it. And then comes along the Zilver PTX by Cook. And this was an FDA-approved uh, drug eluting stent in the SFA. It was a multinational trial, uh, the Zilver PTA, different from the Sirocco stent, does not have a polymer. And what we discovered was that that polymer, because of the actions of the SFA, would fracture. You had stent fracture, you had re -synosis, and the design of that stent was probably not the best design. The design of the Zilver stent was a much better platform and the reason that the results were more durable was because of what we did with drug and what we did by not using a polymer and by using a, a better stent design. Now, if you look at the lesion length for this trial, 5.4 to 4.1 centimeters. So these were short lesions. So this trial was criticized because even though we had very durable long-term results, because we were treating short lesions, so not what we usually see in our typical clinical practice. And about a third of the patients had CTO, so this was more in line with what we see in clinical practice. Dr. Vermani actually, I think, showed you these slides, but you can see that the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves as far as primary patency, so meaning that the patient has an index procedure, it does not have to have another procedure follow-up to maintain that patency, was actually very good and much better with the drug-coated stent as opposed to PTA alone. And then when we look at stent fracture, which is another issue, when we put stents in the SFA, we can see that the stent fracture rate was very low with this device. And we can also see, again, that these are short lesions. This is not what we see typically in the clinical population of patients that we treat on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we try to extrapolate this data to, well, what happens in the real world? What happens by real world um, sort of a 
not such a great term to use, but what happens on a clinical basis once these devices get approved and we can do whatever we want with them, then we can see that with this uh, particular study that the resinosis and adverse events rates were low at one year. So yes, this device was something that could be applicable to the typical patient that you see in your clinical practice. And then we look at what happens with this device out to five years. This is a summary that just basically shows you the scheme for the randomization of the trial. So patients were randomized to either PTA, they had an option to be rescued if they had a suboptimal PTA, and then those were compared to the uh, DES group. And we see when we look again at this Kaplan-Meier curve that the freedom from target lesion revascularization, even out to five years, was durable, and it actually d and continues to increase once we get uh, out to five years. And you look at primary patency again, these patients had that index procedure and out to even five years did not have to have another or a follow-up procedure to maintain patency. So finally on the, um, on the right track. So this was a large randomized trial. The results were durable out to five years. Uh, the outcomes supported that this was both a safe and durable device uh, the patency benefit I showed you was not only durable out to five years, but actually increased after five years. And this benefit was sustained or better than what we got with bare metal stents. And because there was no polymer being used, I think this was another reason that this type of device or this type of technology was probably the right way to go when we use this kind of device. Now, another study, just looking at well, what happens with this, again, sort of in the real world population, this is a study from Japan, and they sort of treated more complex lesions, calcified lesions, bifurcations, um, and what they found was that the one-year results were, again, durable and better or exceeded what you get when you use bare metal or when you use balloon angioplasty alone in this uh, patient population. The stent sizes, these uh, shows you basically the stent sizes that were available when I go to my calf lab manager and order stents, this is what I look at. And so what I have to do is I have to pick the sizes that I think we'll use in my laboratory because I cannot buy these on consignment. These are very expensive devices and if we don't use them, we don't get our money back. So at $4,000 a pop, you have to pick the right ones and you have to use them. So within the cath lab system, I have seven hospitals in my system, that I may send some of these stents to another laboratory if they don't get used. You would think because of the results and the durability that these would get used and this would be a hot commodity and you can't keep them on the shelf wrong. Okay, they don't get used all the time and they actually will, uh, will expire and you end up holding the bat. Now, as far as what's in the future, this is data from the Majestic trial. This was 12-month data, a small number of patients, but using the uh, Alluvia drug eluding vascular stent system. Um, and you can see that the trial design showed symptomatic patients, Rutherford class 2, 3, and 4. Uh, the degree of stenosis was over 70 percent by visual estimation. Vessel diameters, 4 to 6 millimeters, and lesion lengths of 30 to 110. But the highest rates of primary patency that have been reported with any devices in the SFA so far, over 90 percent. And looking at Kaplan-Meier uh, curve, here we can see out to 12 months, over 96 percent without uh, or with primary patency. And that leads to the sort of the final trial, which is the Imperial trial, which will compare the Alluvia stint to the Zilver stint that I discussed with you earlier. They'll have 485 patients. Uh, there'll be 75 sites worldwide in five-year follow-up. This will evaluate safety and effectiveness of this device compared to what's the best on the market right now as far as drug eluding stent technology, the, uh, the Zilver PTX in both popliteal and SFA disease. Uh, in summary, the technologies uh, offer promise for improving outcomes in lower extremity revascularization. The, uh, we need adequately powered, randomized data to say what's better or which one we should be using um, on a more frequent basis. And leave you with one final uh, point. That even if you put a drug eluding stent in the femoral popliteal artery, eventually you'll still have a stent in that vessel.
Thank you very much.